Welcome to Always College Football, and we've tried, and the effort that we've all put in together as a family here at Always College Football, we've tried to make sure that college sports and college football in particular is an outlet for so many, an escape for so many to escape the tragedies of real life. And unfortunately, there are occasions in which real life intersects with that of college football, and that's exactly what transpired on Sunday night. Just want to take a moment to think and acknowledge uh, those that are associated with the Virginia football team, those that are on campus there in Charlottesville. Uh, I just can't even imagine what those people are going through. And look, when you're on a football team, it becomes a brotherhood. Uh, guys from all different walks of life, from all different corners of the United States, in some cases internationally, guys come together and you love one another and you become brothers. And to know that three young men had their lives tragically cut short because of a coward that was also at one point their teammate is just beyond heartbreaking. So we here at Always College Football just want to say a prayer and, and lend a thought uh, and make sure that those associated with Virginia know that we're thinking of them. And especially we'd like to reach out to the families of Devin Chandler, Lavelle Davis, and Deshaun Perry. Although you're gone from us, your impact will not be forgotten. We will continue to honor you and we'll continue to remember the lives that you touched in the short time that you were with us here on earth. So God bless to all of Virginia and of course to the Virginia Cavaliers football team. Well, it's never an easy transition, of course. We're all heartbroken and we're all uh, obviously feeling the effects of what transpired in Charlottesville, but we do have a, a plan in store for you today. We do want to focus on some fun things. We do want to think about some fun things as it relates to the college football world. Just a few weeks left in the regular season, and we're going to try to highlight some things that we found to be very interesting as we are beginning to put a little bit of a bow on what's been a phenomenal college football season. So we're going to talk about playoff expansion. We're going to discuss the 12 team playoff expansion and why it isn't the end of the world, as some have suggested. I also think we need to look at the resume of a few different teams that right now are on the bubble, but still have made very strong cases to be considered at this point. So we're also going to hit the mailbag like we always do on our Tuesday show. So without much further ado, let's talk about it. Football season is here, and nothing beats seeing your favorite team live. Not only does Vivid Seats have great NFL ticket prices, they're also the official ticketing partner of ESPN. And with Vivid Seats rewards, when you buy 10 tickets, you get the 11th free. Download the app or visit vividseats.com today. Vivid Seats, life happens live. Receive a reward credit equal to the average price of 10 tickets purchased, excluding taxes, fees, and processing costs. See vividseats.com slash rewards for terms and conditions. All right, 12-team college football playoff expansion. Okay, we're not going to get into this too much right now, not in the meat of the season, but we do feel like on a day when it's a little bit, hey, we can break down games for this upcoming weekend, but this weekend's slate, very good. Very solid, but we still have three days to get into some of those potential matchups. So we figured we'd take today to just forecast what a 12-team college football playoff would look like. And you're going to sit here and say, I've already heard it from like my buddies because I have long been a supporter of the four-team playoff model. Shoot, I've said that, hey, we should take the college football playoff and expand and contract the amount of teams in based on how many teams should qualify. So I am very open to different ideas when it comes to the college football playoff format, what's best, how it should look, how it's going to make sure it doesn't weaken the regular season, all these other things. All right. I get that. Here's where we're at right now. There are a lot of people that are going to sit here and tell you that the four team playoff is the only way to crown a national champion. The reasons that they support said argument are because they say it's going to weaken the regular season. And you're basically going to allow teams like Alabama and Clemson 
more pathways, additional avenues to get back in the mix, even if they stub their toe a couple times in September, October, or November. While all that is true, and while if you are a fan of a top-tier team, a la, say, Georgia, a la Ohio State, a la Michigan, a la Alabama, a la Clemson, top-tier teams that are always seemingly in the playoff mix, it does give you additional opportunities to mess up and yet still be on the pathway of potentially winning a national championship. Right now, you have to thread the needle, and it makes it feel as though every single game is do or die. And that, I think, I've always supported. I've always been appreciative of. I really have. I've always felt like it was do or die. And that, to me, made it feel like college football was the best regular season. The problem is it's the best regular season for like six or seven teams because you have to thread the needle. And if you lose one, you're out. Or if you lose two, you're out. But is it that great for like the other 125 teams? No, it's not. And here's why I'm very excited about the college football playoff expanding to 12. Because yes, while games like say Georgia, Alabama might not matter, Tell me how important, just right now, tell me how important the ACC championship game is right now. Tell me how important right now, today, the Big 12 championship game is if, for whatever reason, TCU had two losses. Tell me if USC in the next couple of weeks loses a game or two. Tell me how impactful the Pac-12 championship game is. And conversely, tell me what the big deal is right now about the American Athletic Conference Championship game. Like last year, it mattered. Why? Because Cincinnati was on the verge of not just winning their conference, but punching their ticket to the college football playoff. But this year, tell me this. I mean, right now, if the season ended today, you're going to get UCF and Cincinnati. If the season ended today, okay? Oh, but in some way right now, there's a three-way tie at the top. UCF's in prime position because they have the head-to-head -head win against Tulane. Cincinnati's there with one loss as well. So basically, you have three teams that are kind of gunning for it. Well, if it wasn't to go to the New Year's Six, but it was to go to the college football playoff and you get to host a college football playoff game, tell me how much more significant that conference championship game might become. Massive, obviously, for the American. So it strengthens conference championship games across the board. No, it might not strengthen the conference championship game in the Big Ten. It might not strengthen the conference championship game in the SEC because both teams that are playing in the Big Ten or the SEC are probably still going to be in regardless of what their record is or what the outcome is of the conference championship game. But in some of these other leagues... Leagues that haven't been guaranteed a playoff spot here in the recent era. Now the conference championship game means something yet again. And I referenced another thing. I said, okay, well, you know, the Georgias versus the Bamas, the LSUs versus the Bamas this year. Uh, you know, the games involving, say, Tennessee and LSU. Like, you're going to say, well, those games, it didn't matter. They don't matter anymore. Oh, fine. How much do they matter today anyways? Because I think LSU is still in prime position to get into the college football playoff even though they lost by 27 at home to Tennessee. I think Tennessee is still in prime position to get into the college football playoff, even in a four-team format, even though they lost by 14 points to Georgia on the road a couple weeks ago. But here's the thing that I love most about the college football playoff expanding. Talked about the conference championships being stronger, more meaningful, more impactful. But y'all... We would be having conversations right now about Notre Dame being in the college football playoff. We would be having conversations about Florida State being in the college football playoff. We would be having conversations about Kansas State potentially getting into the college football playoff. How about Washington? How about UCLA? How about North Carolina? Teams that were left for dead and teams that people had written off I just listed like five or six different teams. You're going to say, well, those teams are flawed. They don't belong in the conversation. Fine. They might be flawed, but guess what they've also been? They've also improved. 
And I think there needs to be a little bit of a reward and a carrot to dangle out in front of the face of some of these teams that might have stubbed their toe in September. And they say, hey, man, we weren't very good in September. We made some mistakes. We had some self-inflicted mistakes. We had lost games. But look at us now. Look at how much better we've gotten. Still gives teams proper motivation to continue the ascent just for a chance to potentially get into the playoff. And if you get into the playoff, then you have a shot. Ultimately, that's all you want to do. So the 12-team playoff, it goes from us talking about, well, let's measure Georgia versus Ohio State versus Michigan versus Tennessee versus TCU. It takes the field from about eight teams at this point of the year that could potentially make it to like 22 teams. And then guess what? It makes games matter like Purdue at Illinois. Not just for jockeying there in the Big Ten West, even though hopefully by the time we get to the playoff expansion, divisions will no longer matter. At least I hope. Hopefully we get to that point. Because right now, if you need any further example as to when divisions need to be abolished and getting rid of, like I think divisions are the worst, look at the Big Ten West and tell me right now how you're measuring the Big Ten West and who's going to represent the Big Ten West in the Big Ten Championship game. And tell me how much Michigan or Ohio State is going to be favored over the opposing team. That's what I'd like to know as well. So I digress. It would have made Purdue and Illinois last week very, very impactful. It would have made Notre Dame Navy and the comeback that Navy was trying to put together very, very impactful. Think about how important the Arizona over UCLA would have been last week. And at 1030 at night, we're sitting there just trying to keep our eyes open watching this game because there's a playoff spot potentially on the line. Now, I know that there's still a playoff spot on the line right now for UCLA. I get that. I understand that. I'm not trying to suggest that they're dead or done or, or it's over. I'm, I think it's unlikely. <laughs> but there is at least a pathway, so to speak, for the UCLA Bruins to get back in the mix. How about Utah? Maybe that's the best example, right? Utah went and challenged themselves in the first week of the regular season. Where'd they go? They went and played against the likes of the Florida Gators. They lost that game. Difficult road trip, but they lost that game. Then a few weeks later, they lose against UCLA. But what has Utah done since that point? Utah's knocked off USC, of course, in rather impressive showing. And they've won eight of their last nine. The one loss, obviously, being the likes of at UCLA. But you got a good win at Washington State. You take care of business against Arizona. You take care of business this past week against Stanford. Now you go to Oregon, a game that right now doesn't matter when it comes to the college football playoff. Oregon hosting Utah as we move forward in a 12-team environment is potentially one of the biggest games of the year. Loser, out of the Pac-12 championship. Winner, very much in. And depending on how things sort themselves out, they could be in potential position to get an at-large berth as a non-conference champion, even though that feels just the tiniest bit far-fetched. How about this one? Last week, Bama against Ole Miss. A game that was important but important because LSU is going to punch their ticket to the SEC West if Alabama wins. So is this really weird world where LSU fans are rooting for Alabama for the very first time ever. Well, the loser of that game is now out of the college football hunt. But if Ole Miss would have won and they connect there in the middle of the end zone on fourth down for the game-winning touchdown, guess what? Bama's now out, Ole Miss now in. Think about how many more games will be touched by the playoff race. And if we're ultimately trying to make access to the playoff more accessible, we can take six or seven games here in November and expand it to 18, 19, 20 games in November with legitimate playoff implications. And... What do we love more than anything else? Cinderella and spoilers, right? How much, even the teams that are not involved in the college football playoff mix, even the teams that are on the outside looking in and they have no shot of getting to the college football playoff, 
maybe they're comfortably within bowl eligibility. All right, they're sitting there. They're already at six wins, but they have no shot of getting to the college football playoff. Let's say they're six and five, and they get to play against their rival there in the final week of the regular season. How much fun would it be to give the team that has, quote, nothing to play for extra motivation of knocking their rival out of the college football playoff? So when LSU goes to Texas A&M, you know what that game is right now? For the most part, meaningless. But when you give meaning to AM, who's had maybe the most disappointing season in college football history, you now give extra incentive for them to knock off LSU, to knock LSU out of the playoff mix. How huge would that be? What about a team like Auburn, who's playing against Alabama? Alabama, not going to be going to Atlanta. Alabama, only way into the college football playoff is to win out and to sit there at 10 and 2 with a chance to be chosen as an at-large team. Well, guess what? Now Auburn has all the motivation in the world. Not that they, I mean, they want to win the Iron Bowl anyways, but it amplifies that motivation, I think, significantly, if you know you can completely ruin your rival's season. There's a handful of these examples. Tennessee going to South Carolina this week. Obviously, game's very much in the balance. If South Carolina has a crazy environment. South Carolina can play spoiler to not one, but two teams here in the next couple of weeks because they play Clemson next week as well. How fired up would they be? South Carolina, not a whole lot to play for. They're in pretty good shape, but you can now knock off not one, but maybe two playoff teams, ruin their seasons as the game goes along. That to me is phenomenal. So I think that the 12 team playoff, we as college football purists, I've already know that we're going to lose. There's no point in me continuing to put up the fight for the four-team model or the two-team model or the six-team model or the eight-team model. We are going to lose. The 12-team model feels like it's a foregone conclusion. But I'm now more open to the 12-team format than ever before because of the 2022 season. If you can tell me right now, and this will be the last thing I say about it, If you can tell me right now who the best team is and if they all played a round-robin format where Team 4 played Team 20, 5, 19, all the way up, and they have their own little tournament there between Teams 4 and Team 20. So remove the top three teams. Remove Georgia. Remove T. Or excuse me. Remove Georgia. Remove Ohio State, and remove remove Michigan. Start with TCU. Go all the way down to Florida State, who's currently sitting twentieth in the AP poll. Give me that collection of teams. Put a format together where they all play each other. Tell me who you think's going to win. Because I can't tell you who I think's going to win. Because I think Florida State, playing the way they're playing right now, could beat anybody that's ranked between 4 and 19. I think right now, with how Notre Dame is playing, they could definitely beat any team 4 through 16, because or 17, excuse me, because Notre Dame's ranked 18th. Do you see what I'm getting at? Everyone left Notre Dame for dead. Everyone left Florida State for dead. And yet, here they are at the end of the year playing good football with potential access to a 12 team playoff. You're going to say, well, you're just a participation trophy guy. No, I just want teams to still be totally and 100% in on what they can accomplish down the stretch, even if they didn't play very well there in the first few weeks. At what point do we stop? I don't know. I don't think we're going to get to a point in which we stop at 12. I think eventually we'll probably get to 16. Who knows? Maybe we'll get to 32 someday. But I like and am now open to the 12-team playoff because right now, teams 4 through 20, I think anybody can beat anybody. And that's not normally how I feel about the college football season at this point of each and every year. Megra, that's such a great point. And with the 12-team playoff, you know what that's going to eliminate? The most annoying thing in sports, the hypothetical. And only in college football, the hypotheticals rule, where you can look at one team and say, I'm going to put them ahead because... I think they would beat Team X. 
So now you're actually going to get those two teams playing in there in a game that matters as opposed to having media outlets and committees just sit there and say, oh, I think they're going to be better. Isn't this what, like, shouldn't we give these teams chances? Like, are you happy? Are you as happy as I am that we're going to lose the hypotheticals of well, like, the one hey, thing this team's I would not going to win? I get what you're saying. Good. I get what you're saying. But I, here's the one thing I would say. Uh, I think college football has always needed because y'all for a long time, college football was a very niche sport. It was a regional sport. Uh, you're going to say, no, it wasn't. Well, it kind of was the NFL ruled the day, right? The NFL still rules the sporting world here in our country. There's no denying that. Okay. There's no denying that NFL is always going to be top dog, but I do think college football has gotten more and more and more popular in the last 20 years. And I'm not talking about just uh, in the South, it's always been popular, right? In Ohio, it's always been popular, right? Like in Nebraska, it's always been popular. But I don't know if it's been universally popular since the advent of really the, the BCS. Back in 1998, I think that's when it started to become a little bit more mainstream because people could actually comprehend how we crowned a champion. To me, any championship that existed before 1998 is a little bit of a head scratcher. Because I don't, I mean, yeah, they, oh, they, oh, so they played in the the Orange Bowl and then, wait, so who, they, they tied and then, so that means this team won. Like, I, I didn't understand it. It just, it always kind of blew my mind. Wait, so you're telling me AP writers, that, like, they're not, they know ball. So, like, they're, we're, they're voting. Like, uh, that. I always was kind of a little bit, I don't know, to me, and I've said this tongue in cheek, like, any football that existed before 1998 was like, exhibition like i know that people like lose their mind about that but that's just you know I'm, i was born in 88 so i was 10 so i like, take it with a grain of salt and it's, it's obviously cheeky like it's tongue in cheek if you can't read through the tea leaves there but the one thing that we had to do to differentiate ourselves from the nfl was the hypothetical like if we're really going to get down there and we're going to have a discussion on quality of play NFL is going to dominate us. Like the quality of play, the quality of the player, like the 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 level of play that's on the field between the white lines, the NFL is better than we are. Okay? Just the execution's better, okay? It's better players. It shouldn't be, you know, breaking any news by making that assessment. I think college football is far more exciting and I love the diversity that we have in college football. I mean, you could have a triple option team running against the spread team and I love that those teams are going to look completely different and the approach is completely different. Some teams run tempo, some teams bleed the clock. Like I love it. In the NFL, it's kind of cookie cutter. I think in a lot of ways, whereas in the in college, every single team has their own personality and it's a little bit more fun for me to follow. Like I am a college football fan. But I do think that the conversations that we've had in our sport have helped the sport for a very long time because it allowed us to separate from that of the professional model. The professional model was cut and dry. You win your division, you're in. But the speculation, the discussion, for lack of a better word, the arguments, I think helped us for a very long time in the sport. But I'm glad that we're moving away from it. I think it's attracting a more casual audience. And those that are watching this show are probably the hardcores. You might not like it. I understand that. But we have to try to grow and we have to continue to try to appeal to new potential fans of the sport. And if you can comprehend the format with which we crown a champion, then I think the likelihood of you potentially following the sport as a diehard in the future is significantly higher. So yes, speculation, conversation, hypotheticals, very, very, very good for a long time. But I'm glad that it's going to be in the rearview mirror, even though that won't completely be in the rearview mirror. If you think that when we expand to 12, all of a sudden the hypotheticals are going to die, you're wrong. <laughs> because everyone sitting there evaluating the teams are going to look at team 11, 12, 13, and 14 and they're going to say, well, hang on. I think 14, 14 could beat 11 if, you know, if the, if it was windy that day. Oh, well, I, you know, I think the team 13 could beat 12 if for whatever reason they lost their starting running back. Like we're still going to have the hypotheticals. You know how I know why? Because in the NCAA basketball tournament, 
we have more people ticked off about who's on the bubble and who's not on the bubble than we do about the actual tournaments that are going on to put teams into the playoff, into the March Madness tournament. Like, I have had more discussions. About, well, Syracuse shouldn't be in. They're 17 and 14. <laughs> That's with 68 teams, okay? 68. And, by the way, basketball might expand further. People are going to watch college football because football is by far the most popular sport in America. And even though we're going to now have maybe a few more flawed teams that are playing in the playoff, it, it doesn't matter. People are going to watch because they're entertained. And I think that whether you completely support the 12-team playoff or you're meeting it with resistance, we need to concede defeat anyways. It's coming. Now, and especially this year, 2022, 12-team playoff would be pretty neat this year, especially knowing just how close some of these teams may be ranked between... Well, if you want to exclude teams 4 and 5, take teams 6 through 20. Tell me how interchangeable some of those teams may be. If you need an example, where is LSU ranked right now? Just out of sheer curiosity. LSU is sitting there at 6. Guess who beat LSU? Team 20. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence. The confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear. More driven. Oh, and one more thing about the college football playoff expansion. If there's one thing we've learned this year is that home field matters, right? I mean, if there's nothing else that you can take away from the 2022 season, look at the home field and the impact it's had on multiple games this year. I can think off the top of my head how much it helped Georgia when they took care of business against Tennessee. I can think about how much it helped Michigan when they took care of business against Penn State. I can think about TCU, how they had a couple home games this year. And man, it was really close and it was not pretty until things got going. The best example might have been when they played against Oklahoma early in the year. Tennessee, how much did the home field help them against Alabama? Significant, right? LSU, how much did it help them against Alabama, right? And there have been examples too. You can probably shoot holes in it and say, well, you know, there, Tennessee went to LSU and it was a non-factor. Sure, yeah, there's examples of that. I get it. Like, I understand. But think about how the home field has impacted games this year. Oregon has used their home field, gosh, against UCLA. It was absolutely rocking that day. I think it was a big, big reason why that game was dicey. Penn State even, I mean, I know it didn't look as you kind of look at the final score, but Penn State's home field against Ohio State was a factor in the game. Do I need to keep going? Because I will. I, I can go on down the list. I can talk about how, uh, you know, Notre Dame, that home field against Clemson was significant. Okay? What I'm getting at, and this is a long preamble way of saying, can't you just envision a scenario? Just envision this scenario, okay? You have the 12th ranked team, in college football, let's say it's Clemson, whatever. All right. Let's just, for, for the sake of the argument, let's say this year it's Oregon. All right. How cool would it be to see Oregon go to Ann Arbor in six inches of snow to play against the Michigan Wolverines in the middle of December? How cool would that be? How about this one? How cool would it be to see Alabama, who, let's say they're number nine in college football. Let's say the group of five champion is in there at number six. Let's say this year's group of five champion is UCF. Why these two teams would come up, I'm not sure. Alabama traveling to the bounce house, looking up, at their press box 
where it says 2017 National Champions. UCF hosting Alabama there in Orlando. How phenomenal would that be? What if that game came down to a field goal too? You know, and it's like returned 56, you know, 109 yards with the coach oh, there. I gotcha. don't know. It would be fun. Yeah, that, that's, that, I'm glad that you brought that up. I uh, appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, but I can, I mean, think about the matchups and think about the potential. Think about the possibilities. Think about the home field environments that you're going to have for teams five, six, seven, and eight. Think about what it's going to be like as they tee it up against teams 9, 10, 11, and 12. 9, 10, 11, and 12 are always, right? They're always going to be at-large teams. They're always going to be teams that didn't win their conference. All right? 99% of the time, always going to be teams that didn't win their conference. Them going on the road into an insanely hostile environment would be phenomenal. And the only thing I can really point to, and look, the NFL is not college. It's, it's not. The environments in college football are better than that of the environments in the NFL. But I'll say this. <laughs> I will say this. As someone that played in a playoff environment in the NFL, didn't play, but was there. All right. Luckily, I didn't play. <laughs> I was there. A playoff environment in the league is pretty dang good. So if it's good in the league, imagine how good it would be in college football. This episode is brought to you by AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure. Is checking your team stats at 2 a.m., watching highlights while eating with buddies, or catching the game during a wedding all too much? Nope, because too much college football is never too much. And AT&T 5G keeps you connected all season long. 5G requires a compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. All right, moving ahead now as we always try to get into our mailbag, especially on Tuesdays. Always college football at gmail.com. All right, always college football at gmail.com. So you can always hit us up, send us your questions. We've got a laundry list of them, I might add. So we're going to get to some of those. Some are, by the way, appreciate those that have sent some in. You're probably like, well, why haven't you Why haven't you read them yet? We're, we're going to get to them. If they're more big picture, we're saving them for the off season. Okay. If they're specific to a time and place, we're trying to prioritize those. So if they're more big picture, still continue to send them in. But we'll get to those here as the season concludes a couple weeks, couple months from now. So continue to send them in. Always college football at gmail.com. We will get to them. I promise you. We have a lot of shows between now and the kickoff of 2023. We're going to definitely dive in. All right. So Coops, kick it off. All right. First one coming from Greg in Hartford. If you were handing out coach of the year, not the coach that is the most talent, but the one who has really done an unbelievable job of coaching, who would it be? Well, I think there's a bunch that would be on the list. And I, I always, if I'm doing coach of the year and, and I'm a voter in the Broyles Award, which goes annually to the nation's top assistant, uh, I don't often look at the talent that's on the roster. I think about where they were last year relative to where they are this year. Teams that have had the most significant leap, maybe the side of the football that had the most significant leap, those are usually where I try to assess, which is why you know the the Broyles Award this year is really interesting. I mean, you got uh, you know Jim Knowles will be in the mix. You got Matt House at LSU will be in the mix. I mean, there's be a bunch that are in the mix this year. But as far as head coaches are concerned, a lot of it has to do with what you walked into. What did the place look like before you arrived? And what do things look like right now? First year head coaches are always going to get a little bit more love with me because it's not easy. I feel like in this day and age, not easy in this day and age to get guys back on board because as soon as there's a coaching change, boom, you're going to have 10, 15 guys potentially enter the portal immediately. So that I think makes being a first year head coach even that much more difficult. So the first year head coaches might get just a little bit more love with me. But the short list is as follows, and this shouldn't be a huge surprise. I have 
Sonny Dykes at TCU, very much in the mix as a coach of the year candidate. Brian Kelly at LSU would be very much in the mix as a coach of the year candidate. Lincoln Riley at USC would be very much in the mix as a coach of the year candidate. But I don't want to be exclusive to just, you know, first year guys that have surprised us all. I also think there needs to be some value in a guy that has just incrementally improved over the course of time, which is why Mike Norvell at Florida State would be in the mix for me as a coach of the year candidate. Chris Kleiman at Kansas State, what he's done has been tremendous as well. Really, really impressive job that he's done there at Kansas State over the course of time. I think you could even make a case and you're going to say, what? Luke Fickle at Cincinnati. Look how many people that they lost. Look how many people that they lost. And yet they're still sitting here firmly in the top 25, still within striking distance of potentially getting to the New Year's Six yet again. He'd be in the mix. How can you not consider Lance Leipold? Lance Leipold, I know they're six and four. I know Kansas hasn't played as well recently, but Lance Leipold would very much be in the mix as well. Brett Bielema, had he not lost the last couple of weeks, he would have been in the mix there at Illinois. What a job he's done. And then finally, <laughs> you're going to laugh, but I never thought that the words coach of the year could potentially be next to a certain specific school. Regardless of who the coach is, I might add, I don't think any one of us, any one of us could ever envision a scenario where, by the way, Josh Heupel at Tennessee, he's in the mix as well. I apologize. I was just going down the laundry list of guys at the top of my head. Josh Heupel also in the coach of the year mix. All right. So before you freak out, Tennessee fans, he's very much under a lot of consideration with how his team's performed here in year two. But how can you possibly ignore what Jim Mora is doing at UConn is a team that is bowl eligible. You know how bad UConn's been over the course of a five or six year period. I believe they won 10 games, 10 games over a five or six year period. And yet they're bowl eligible right now at six and five. And they go to army this weekend. Army is favored. I might add, but it's only a 10 point margin. The puppies last week, they were 13-point dogs and still got it done against Liberty. So tons of credit to Jim Mora. He won't win Coach of the Year, but he deserves to be in the mix with how he's turned things around there in stores and gotten the Huskies to play pretty good football. That is very fair. Jim Mora, great job there. Uh, next one, Steve Timlin in Atlanta. Who's the better tight end, Michael Mayer or Brock Bowers? See, what, what do you want your tight end to be? would be the first question that I'd ask because it's one of those scenarios where do you want your tight end to be a, you know, a well-rounded, I'm going to put him at the end of the line of scrimmage. I'm going to block. I'm going to use him in a bunch of different ways off play action. I can win with him in one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, he's, he's really just more of a well-rounded down in, down out, three down tight end. He can win in the passing attack, but has it doesn't have crazy, crazy speed to threaten the defense vertically. Okay. Obviously I'm describing Michael Mayer, but do I want him or do I want what Brock Bowers is who you just put him split him out wide as a wide receiver and they have to decide immediately. Do you cover him with a corner? Do you cover him with a safety? If you cover him with a safety, you're in trouble. So you might as well just double cover him. You basically have to dictate, all right, we got to double cover him. So if you double cover him, guess what? Everyone else is in singles to the left-hand side. That's where I'm going to be looking. Well, if that's safety and he, Bowers gets one-on-one, -on -one, I'm throwing it to Bowers. Come hell or high water, it doesn't matter. It's a little bit like the Rob Gronkowski type of approach where if you put him in one-on-one, -on -one, it's a wrap. I think Michael Mayer is a lot like Gronkowski. I think he's a lot like Gronkowski. I think Gronkowski a little bit longer than Michael Mayer, but still very willing to be active at the line of scrimmage, very dependable, very sure-handed, and does a pretty good job in all aspects of the game. I think Brock Bowers is a little bit more like Travis Kelsey, or prior to him, Jimmy Graham, who, by the way, unstoppable force there in a lot of ways. 
going to catch a ton of passes, going to get great volume. You can use him in a bunch of different ways. You can put him at running back and line him up at running back and hand him stretch zone if you want to. And he'll probably be pretty dang good at it. Might even be one of your best guys at it. So I think Brock Bowers, I look at him more as an H tight end, which is a movement tight end. I can put him and move him around. I can put him at fullback. I can have him yard on, yard off the line of scrimmage. I can motion him. I can do a bunch of different things with his versatility. Michael Mayer, to me, is a little bit more like George Kittle, a little bit more like Rob Gronkowski, where he's more well-rounded, but he's not as versatile. Either way, phenomenal football player. I, for one, being a passer, I lean more towards the guy that can take it the distance. And in today's day and age in college football, I want a guy that can actually take it 75 yards for a touchdown by making guys miss and then breaking tackles. So I lean just ever so slightly in favor of Brock Bowers, but I cannot deny just how great Michael Mayer is and just how good he is at doing the little things in the blocking and doing the little things that he needs to do to become a complete player. All right, last one, Sam in Houston. If the ball bounced another way, who outside the top 10 could be having a special season? If the ball, like if a game didn't, if a game if would something, have, if something, yeah, something happened. I guess he's Sam's asking if something just didn't go funny. If if LSU didn't get an extra point blocked, but they're already right. six. So who outside of the top ten could be in that that spot? Well, LSU would be the best example. If they don't get an extra point blocked, you know, who knows what happens? Uh, Bama, I think, is in a situation somewhat similar to that. Even though Bryce is playing, I'm not sure he's at 110 percent with the shoulder injury that he sustained uh, against Arkansas. Uh, I think you could look at a scenario like, say, Utah. You go down, you score, and you don't turn it over inside the red zone twice, once on downs, once by way of interception. Utah sitting there at 9-1 and one with a win over USC, very much in the mix of the college football playoff world. Uh, you look at, say, Oregon. If they don't play or schedule Georgia, what's the conversation around? What's they schedule the likes of, say, Utah State and they win convincingly? What's the narrative surrounding Oregon? I think that you could make a case, too. I mean, other teams of significance, um, as far as the ball kind of bouncing a different way, if Kansas State, let's use them as an example, if Kansas State has a healthy quarterback situation, against TCU, is the outcome potentially a little bit different? If Kansas State doesn't have a complete hangover against the likes of Tulane in the third week of the regular season after they beat Missouri and looking ahead to their road trip against Oklahoma, that was total sandwich game. Kansas State played the worst game probably of the Chris Kleiman era. If they don't do that, we're sitting there looking at a team that might have just one loss on the season. Of course, they could have very easily beaten TCU if their quarterback situation was a little bit better. And if they don't disrespect Tulane by looking ahead, maybe they win that game as well. They could be sitting in a situation that you know they're 9-1 and one within striking distance. So uh, I think there's a handful, a handful of games like that where it could be very different. The optics of the season could be very, very different if not for an injury or a misstep or something along the lines of that that completely altered what the team was going to do down the stretch. Starting your own small business can be a total roller coaster. Between all those bumpy twists and turns comes the actual business side of your business, which can really throw you for a loop. Luckily, with QuickBooks, you can manage your business with confidence from the start. So no matter how bumpy the ride gets, you can always stay on track. New business, no problem. Success starts with Intuit QuickBooks. Learn more at quickbooks.com. All right, final thought here on Always College Football. It's been kind of a somber day for us. We've tried to talk about some uplifting aspects of the sport, things that are fun. But my mind and, and everything else as a father, it just can't escape the tragedy that went down in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, just hug your loved ones. You just never know. This is a really, really, really heartbreaking tragedy. Uh, and to think, too, that uh, a teammate was involved in killing three other teammates is just unthinkable, an unthinkable tragedy. 
And we had, I mean, goodness gracious, 125 guys on the team. And every single one of those guys was like a brother. Uh, we had our disagreements. We had our arguments. We had our fights, uh, mostly about, you know, things that didn't necessarily matter, like Kobe versus LeBron or, you know, Lakers versus Heat or whatever it may be. We had all sorts of disagreements, but man, uh, the thought of losing one of those guys to another teammate is just unthinkable. And and I'm thinking about Tony Elliott. I'm thinking about the players on that team. I'm thinking of anyone that's ever been in a college football locker room uh, and knowing just how close those locker rooms can be and to think that three of your teammates are not going to be there today when they show up at the facility for practice is just, it's unspeakable. Uh, so like I said, we said it at the very beginning and we're going to, continue to talk about about college football that's what we do um oftentimes you know life gets in the way of of talking about sports and and ultimately um don't take anything for granted don't take any time for granted uh hug your loved ones tell your friends you love them tell your kids you love them uh because you just never know when things like this can potentially come up. And it's sad that we live in a world in which things like this happen as often as they do. So uh, thinking about those players again, Devin Chandler, uh, Lavelle Davis, and Deshaun Perry, uh, our heartfelt condolences go out to everybody at uh, the University of Virginia and our heartfelt condolences go out to their teammates. Uh, and of course, everybody uh, in the ACC family. I know it's a, it's a close knit group and, and we will certainly keep them in our thoughts and our prayers. So it's tough to really think about anything other than that on a day like today. Uh, so we'll put a bow on it by saying this. Thanks for being with us. Uh, thanks so much for, for all that you've done to, to help make this show successful and, and for all that you've done to, to allow us to, to wake up and talk about something that we love and feel so passionately about. Um, just really, really grateful and very, very appreciative of time. Ultimately, time is, is all we have. And it's the one thing that, that ultimately we don't have enough of. So we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Uh, prayers up to all those affected by this unspeakable tragedy. We'll be back again tomorrow. But for all of us here at Always College Football, we hope you have a wonderful day.